Welcome back. It is December 15th, and we are heading into Luke chapter 15 on our way through the Gospel according to Luke from December 1st to December 24th as we read the 24 chapters of Luke on our way to Christmas. Last time, we finished up in chapter 14 with Jesus and his message regarding counting the cost. Um, no man builds a tower unless he makes sure he has everything that he needs to finish it. No man goes to war without first assessing the magnitude of the force that he's about to go against. And uh, he describes the devotion and the level of commitment that he's looking for in verse 27 of chapter 14 is this, whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his cross. Uh, this At this point when he was teaching would not have had context for them. Who would have been able to understand what he meant by bearing their cross? A cross was an instrument of torture. A cross was an instrument of, of uh, execution, of death, uh, a penalty for for evildoers and so to bear your cross who could understand what that meant he will eventually show what it means to bear the cross and from that we get an understanding of what it means to follow him we must be willing to deny ourselves to die to self to live through vicarious suffering for the sake of others to offer our lives for others like he did for us this is what it means to deny yourself and bear your cross. He also talks about salt. If salt uh, is lost its flavor, what shall, how shall it be seasoned? It's neither fit for the land or for the dunghill, but men throw it out. He who hear, has ears to hear, let him hear. Uh, he's comparing our devotion to him, our zeal for him, to salt. Uh, we're the salt of the earth, he would say, in another place. And so if we've lost our zeal, our our devotion to him, then we've become flavorless and useless for the purpose of spreading the gospel, spreading the good news of Jesus. So we have to stay salty. Well, that brings us to chapter 15, so let's pray and we'll get right into it. So, Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for the, the clarity with which you call us. Lord, you're not calling us to some half-hearted devotion, Lord, adding you to our already full lives. No, Lord, you're looking to be central in our lives, that everything we say and do and the way we spend our time and our resources would, would be filtered through our understanding of who you are, Lord, that our lives might bring you glory. And so, God, I pray that you would do this transforming work in us as we sit at your feet, as we read your word and allow it to wash over our minds, Lord, I pray that this reading of your word would go out like seed into the airways here, Lord, and, and would not return void, but would return with the purpose for which you sent it out. Lord, draw people to yourself, I pray, and be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Luke chapter 15. Then all of the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he spoke this parable to them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine just persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. Likewise. I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Then he said, 
A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that fall to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him in the fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted calf here, and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your father has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has, I'm sorry, your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time, and yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost, and is found. This is the Word of God. In this chapter, we find Jesus as the one who finds lost things. He gives three examples of lost things in this chapter. A lost sheep, a lost coin, and a lost son. These are parables, of course, and in them they're illustrating something very, very important for us to understand. We're lost. Mankind, humankind is lost. Every one of us individually are born into this world sinners and lost. Lost, separated from God our Father. The interesting thing about these lost things are the lost sheep has apparently no way of finding its way back to its shepherd. And so the shepherd has to go out for it. When he finds it, the shepherd puts it on his shoulders and brings it back and rejoices with his friends. Notice, he puts the sheep on his shoulders. There are some who would suggest that he has to carry it on his shoulders because he breaks its legs because it went out and got lost. That is not it. That is not anywhere in this parable. The sheep has to be put on his shoulders because the sheep is weary. The sheep is so worn out it couldn't walk all the way back from where it was lost. The shepherd compassionately and lovingly carries the sheep back. It essentially has no power 
of its own. No power to find its way back and no power to get back even if it knew the way. The lost coin, the coin is just sitting there wherever is lost. Uh, the coin has no way of getting back to the woman. The only way the coin is going to be found is if this woman searches everywhere for it and finds it. And likewise with the lost son, though he does go back to the father, there's no way he's going to be reinstated as a rightful son of this father through his own efforts. He was willing to try. He was willing to just come back and be a servant. In other words, let me just work for you and you can pay me the wages that I earn. The father would have none of it. The only way this son's going to get back into that house is through the grace of this father. The father's not going to let him work his way back. The Father is going to graciously receive him back and restore him. Why? One, because the Father is compassionate and merciful and loving toward his Son. And the other is because the Son, having realized the error of his ways, humbled himself and came back. What a beautiful message there is here. Interestingly, though, there's one more lost thing in this chapter. There's another brother of this young man who, who went astray, another son of this father. And that son has a type of lostness that has been referred to by Tim Keller, say, as elder brother lostness. Elder brother lostness. The younger son was separated from his father through his indiscretions and his sin. The older brother is separated from his father because of his righteousness or his believing that he's righteous. I have never transgressed any of your commandments. It reminds us of the, the, the Pharisee that we met a few chapters back. Uh, who's my neighbor, right? Um, and so this son refuses to go in and celebrate. This son will not celebrate with his father because he believes he deserves something from his father. He believes that his obedience deserves something from his father. That's a type of lostness. In the one case, in the three cases, you're, you're not found unless someone comes and gets you. Um, you can't work your way back. In the elder brother lostness case, the only way you're going to be found is if you stop the kind of work you're doing. The work you're doing, you believe, is earning you merit with God. The only merit we have with God is the merit earned by Christ on our behalf. That righteousness is graciously bestowed upon any who would put their faith and trust in Him alone, and not in their own good works. This is the Gospel. This is the Master Teacher. This is Jesus, the seeker of those who are lost. If you're lost, turn to Christ. If you're believing you're righteous, drop your righteous doing, or the motivation for it at least, and receive salvation through simple faith in Christ. And then your good works will be a joyful response to the knowledge of your salvation. Praise God. Um, next uh, chapter, 16, is tomorrow. So join me again for that, and until then, be well, and God bless you.